You're drinking fluoridated water, not because it helps your children's tooth, teeth, but because a, a federal official took a $775,000 bribe. This is the way things are done in Washington. Uh, well, medicine is big business, right? Medicine is big business, and it pays well if you're in the right position <coughs> at the right time. So Oscar Ewing took his bribe. He went to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and he developed one of the biggest office complexes in the South, uh, which is now filled with government offices since he was head of the Democratic National Commission. It's called the uh, Triangle Research Corporation, and it made him and his family wealthy beyond their wildest dreams. That $775,000 was parlayed into a $50 million research center, owned entirely by the recipient of this bribe. So he got the research center and we got the fluoridation. And the fluoridated water, one of the effects of this on the human system is it damages the immune system. <clears throat> In other words, your immune system, if you have been drinking fluoridated water over a period of time, two years or 10 years or so what, uh, it loses its effectiveness. So it's no longer able to combat illnesses, particularly pernicious diseases uh, and ailments like cancer. <clears throat> and AIDS also, uh, stems directly from uh, the fluoridated water. Most of your AIDS victims came from large cities which had been the first to fluoridate their water. So, uh, because of the immune system, it made it more the immune susceptible? System, more susceptible to AIDS. Uh, now, the AIDS virus supposedly attacks the immune system, but the immune system has already been under attack for a long time from the person who's been drinking fluoridated water. So, uh, really, what has happened when you get HIV virus is that it attacks an already weakened immune system. And uh, so this is the real explanation of AIDS and not because a little green monkey supposedly uh, got together with a woman in the heart of Africa in some village and suddenly everybody came down with AIDS all over the world. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, the drug trust figures, tell them anything, they'll swallow it uh, because we've got the media and we, we tell them this. Well, they've been, we've been swallowing enough drugs for a long time. <laughs> well, we been, have indeed, yes. Yeah, it's like we have been perpetually drugged over the last 50 years regardless. But the Drug Trust and the Rockefellers, their treatment for cancer is called the cut, slash, and burn technique of curing. And, of course, uh, it's sure death. Uh, it's a slow death. I mean, it's like the old Indians, you know, when they would uh, capture you. Uh, on the frontier in the early days of this country and they would stake you out and torture you for four or five days or as long as you could last. Well, the doctors do the same thing uh, when they diagnose cancer. That means you're in for a, a really long period of torture until you finally succumb. What about the cancer society itself? I mean, people give a lot of money to the cancer society. Is that beneficial for them to do so? Well, uh, they have these annual cancer drives in which uh, the people in all the small towns of America uh, are forced to go out and uh, collect money for the American Cancer Society and I describe that as the, the little people collecting money for the big rich. Mm -hmm. uh, American Cancer Society is a big rich uh, organization and uh, if you remember that it was founded at the Union League Club in New York City, the wealthiest club in New York, by John D. Rockefeller Jr. See, John D. Rockefeller Jr. was a great philanthropist, and he said, we're going to do something about cancer, so I am founding and I'm putting up the money for the American Cancer Society. See, the Rockefeller uh, family has had a long-term commitment to cancer. See, the founder of the dynasty, old John D.'s father, William Rockefeller, uh, was a carnival sideshow barker who sold bottles of mineral oil for $5 a piece, and he advertised himself as the great cancer specialist. And so he sold these all up and down uh, through Pennsylvania and Ohio uh, when he wasn't running from the law, because he also was a very famous horse thief, and he also had 18 warrants out against him for rape. So just a very colorful character. <laughs> and so John D. Rockefeller, his son, was just the opposite, because he was so horrified by his father uh, his father's escapades, and he led a very uh, bourgeois life, very quiet, very good family life, and uh, devoted himself to making money. But he found out that at least his father had one asset, and that was that making money through cancer cures was a surefire thing. So the Rockefeller family today is the dynasty which is behind all the cancer treatment in the United States through the Sloan Kettering Cancer Mausoleum of New York City. Well. What would you do, Eustace, if one of your very, very close 
uh, relatives or friends had cancer, would you just, uh, where do you go? Do you go to the hospital? Do you have a checkup or do you eat apricot juice or what? Well, I have a relative who has cancer, has had it for five years. And unfortunately, he went the whole route. Uh, first, he had 25 radiation treatments. Then he had 34 um, chemotherapy treatments. And, uh, you know, and the cancer spread to his bones because none of these things do anything to stop the cancer. It causes you a lot of misery, but it doesn't really affect the cancer. So uh, he's had quite a difficult time of it. Do you mean to tell me that chemotherapy really doesn't help, or can it help, or can't, the, I mean, is there any way? I mean, what about radical, what about surgery? And you're saying that there's no way. Cancer, I mean, if you cut the area that's cancerous out, uh, doesn't it have a, a, a stopping action? Or? Well, you'll see feature stories in the press uh, constantly where some individual somewhere, they found somebody who did have cancer and who had this treatment, and so now they proudly announce the cancer is in total remission. In other words, there is no cancer there. And uh, unfortunately, this is what the medical monopoly itself calls anecdotal medicine. In other words, you, t you t uh, tell a story about some something that happened to your grandfather or your nephew or somebody, and that uh, it was uh, the cancer went into remission. But there's absolutely no scientific basis for any of these claims. And um, the story that the medical monopoly puts out is this person was diagnosed as having cancer and they went to the hospital and they had radiation or chemotherapy and the cancer went into remission and they've lived ever happily ever after. But there again, you have absolutely no way of evaluating uh, this hype which is in the media. I want to personally thank one of America's number one patriots, Mr. Eustace Mullins, for his courage in being able to author a book of such significance in the face of the dynasties, the syndicates, and the anti-middle class establishment. Eustace, I thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you, and I want you back on the Bobby Lee Show soon. Thank you, Bobby Lee. I'll look forward